Welcome to Access TV's Unlock the Minds podcast. Join us as we unlock the minds of industry leading innovators, visionaries, and pioneers. As founders of the Hwood Group, John Terzine and Brian Toll are the creative visionaries behind over a dozen of today's most exclusive restaurants, clubs, and bars across Southern California, Colorado, Chicago, and Las Vegas. Since the inception of the company and their partnership as entrepreneurs, the two have amassed a wealth of intelligence that has led them to success in a volatile entertainment and hospitality landscape. Nevertheless, their perseverance, attention to detail, and principles, which they share with us in this episode, are just some of the priceless insights that have catalyzed their momentum in reaching new heights in the business world. With that being said, please enjoy this long-form conversation with none other than John Terzian and Brian Toll. John and Brian, welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to get right into it with a question that I feel is very appropriate given how you guys have both worked together and came this far since the inception of Hwood. As you both know, partnerships are pretty hard to sustain and most of them don't last. So how have you leveraged your skills individually to develop dynamically as a partnership and as a company? Uh, well, I mean, we've been partners now since about 2006 or seven, something like that. So we sort of learned how to work well together. I think the nice thing is John and I have kind of different things that we're good at. John is amazing with people and the crowd and the marketing. And so that's really his lane. And I handle more of sort of business and accounting and operations and that sort of thing. So we're not on top of each other. We sort of have different things we focus on. I think if we were both the same person, I don't think it would have worked. Yeah, I think the best partnerships um, are when you're when you have strengths in your own areas, you know it, you trust the other to do their thing and you do your thing. If it's the same type of person, it, I don't see how it would work. Um, so, you know, we can fight all day, every day, Brian and I, and at the end of the day, we know our core, what we want to get to in the end, we agree on. And it's actually necessary to have those differing thoughts and, and feelings to push the company and whatever we're doing forward. So we've really been in it for, like you said, for since 2006, I'd say. And um, I don't think it would work any other way. So that's about 14 years to the year now. And it's pretty commendable since partnerships don't usually get through the first few years, let alone the first 10 successfully, um, especially, you know, with ventures in the hospitality and entertainment industries. With that said, can you share an example of a situation or venture that was successful when you both approached it with a, you know, divide and conquer mindset and how you came together to achieve that? Uh, you know, I think, I think the way, um, the way I look at it, Brian may look at it differently, but what, what, for me, I am the eternal optimist in a lot of ways. Um, I think that we're going to conquer anything and everything and um, want to take on the world. That's, that's kind of how I am um, in life and, and for business. Brian is, is, might feel the same way, but he's extru- a lot more pulls, pulls back the reins in the sense of let's be methodical about X, Y, and Z. Let's look at this project this way. And he's a lot more actually to the extreme opposite of, uh, as I am. And what we do is we usually go through it and argue about it or talk about it or at length for days, weeks, sometimes months, and come to some sort of either middle ground or decision. And I don't think those decisions can be made if we didn't have such extreme opposite views overall. Um, But like I said, I think the key is that if you don't have the general core understanding and respect of each other, it would never work, if that makes sense. Absolutely. No question about it. You know, in fact, I believe that all of us here can agree that trust and respect are two of the core tenets of any relationship, whether it be in life or business. And needless to say, it seems that it's been working well for you in that regard. Yeah. I mean, l- luckily it's, it, it has been, but you know, there's, it's, it's entrepreneur, which I view us as entrepreneurs first and foremost, and the industry we're in is hospitality and, um, 
I think that every entrepreneur could agree that there's there's so many lows and so many highs that you don't if you don't have that compatible other whether whether you guys have the same views or not if you have if you don't have someone else going through it together it's pretty hard it's pretty hard and you got to maintain that never get too high with the highs or lows with the lows because they're so it's such a it's such a crazy world i mean look what we're going through right now you know if 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 we didn't have each other to plan things out with uh you know the pause on the world going on especially our industry be really challenging uh yeah i totally agree with john i think well from the first question yeah at, at this point we're a pretty big company so it's really not a single person's decision or a single person's job we sort of have a process and if john wants to do a new project or i do we kind of run it up the channel and we discuss it and we discuss it with our board and we discuss it with our you know ops people and make sure it makes sense for us and then we kind of go from there so it really is a team effort with us um, and at that point, you know, we kind of each have our own thing. So I kind of help get it off the ground. And then John kind of takes over and is there and handles the marketing and all, all that side. So uh, I agree. Ha having both sides of the coin has really been able, has really kind of made us excel at a much quicker pace. You know, we have two people. So there's two people that can kind of, help get things off the ground and help get us where we need to be. 100%. And that really brings me right into what I wanted to run by you guys next was, you know, throughout the 14 years and counting, how have you guys positioned yourselves for opportunity being in the right place at the right time? You know, back when you guys opened Bootsy Bellows, I believe that there was a certain degree of uh, opportunity there that you guys positioned yourselves for to be successful and ready for it. And now moving into Las Vegas uh, with Delilah win. How much of it is sheer luck versus positioning from your perspective? You know, I, I always say it's kind of a, a nice combo of luck and timing. I think you obviously have to have a great concept or a great product or a great widget, whatever it is. But I think you have to have some luck and timing as well. So before Bootsy Bellows, John and I owned three places in Hollywood. And I would say we didn't really didn't do anything different at Bootsy. Um, we've always been very strong at bringing in the right people, having the right crowd. We both grew up in L.A. We both were in high school here, college here. We've always had like this great network of people. Being in Hollywood, it was very tough to get them to drive that extra two miles. So, you know, we, we didn't really live up to our potential being in Hollywood. We then decided, you know what, we kind of grew up more on the west side. We need to move what we're doing that direction. Bootsy sort of fell in our lap. It was owned by uh, a friend of mine who basically didn't want to be in nightlife anymore. It was Truesdale, and he sold it to us. And from the second the place opened, it, just being on that part of town was a whole new ballgame. So I think having the same product and just being in different parts of town made a big difference. So the, the timing of it. It happened to be perfect. We had just closed down Las Palmas in Hollywood, and then this Bootsy kind of popped up in our lap. So I, I think a lot that's a, a good combo. And and then same same with the Lila Vegas. I mean, look, we we were were partners with Hakkasan for about four years. They own part of our company. We ended up buying them out about two years ago, and at the time we had a lot of different hotels and people in Vegas uh, come after us to do one of our brands. And we happen to have a pretty good friend, Alex Cordova at the Wynn, who really pushed us along and made it happen. And um, it kind of just, they needed a venue in that space. And we had just gotten out of the Hakkasan deal. So we were able to do things in different casinos finally. So again, the timing, look, Delilah is a great brand. So you need that first and foremost, but just kind of all fell together with the win and the timing and, the, and buying out Hakkasan. And then, you know, for my one half of our, of our role here, everything Brian said is true. I noticed, so a, a couple of things when we were, when, when Brian and I were both uh, starting out and uh, I mean, technically we both started as promoters. Brian was, uh, had a lot bigger of a promotion company. I was doing more events and parties and working for DJ AM and stuff. But at the time, uh, you know, 
all the quote unquote cool or hot nightclubs or restaurants even, in my opinion, were really in LA, were not well thought out, slapped together, and the people behind it, you know, no offense to any people at that time that were great, but they I, I don't think that they were in it for the right reasons. They were in it for whether it was to be cool or for uh, girls or for whatever it might partying, whatever it might be. And I noticed that uh, the staff wasn't treated right. Guests weren't treated white, right. Um, and then most importantly, my background w- was and is art. And I just, you know, I, I loved uh, London and I loved New York and I thought they were doing incredible places and LA just wasn't. There was no attention to detail and nothing. And so we really set our sights on building places that paid a lot of attention to detail from aesthetics, design, the ambiance, to care of the of the guest, care of the company or staff that's in it, or the workers and, and everyone involved. Um, and our whole thing is that we treat it like family. And, and we started with we're going to gear towards our friends and friends of friends, and that's what, that's what we're going to do. And we, both Brian and I, were and are always have been in it for the business itself. We're not in it for any other reason, you know. Um, and we've we've really set our sights on being the above board businessman, and, and it's taken a, a long build compared to others. But I think I'm proud of the way we've approached it and done it. And um, you know, I always said no one. I had I, I always heard about these great people having mentors and stuff, and I was kind of bummed that I'd never really felt that I had one. And I always said, I'll, I'll always try to, if I'm ever, ever in a position to mentor others, uh, I would always do that. And so we are in positions to do that now. And we always try to instill this with, with kids that either work for us or intern for us, or even just email and do meetings with us. You know, those are the things that we really try to um, bestow upon them. And those are the things that I think have separated us. Given what you just mentioned, I believe it's important to highlight a certain aspect of uh, your and Hwood's success. And I think it's rooted in being in the right place at the right time, but more practically driving in and surrounding yourself with the right people. So with that said, how have you guys been able to separate yourselves apart from the rest uh, of the operators in the city? It seems that from the beginning, you knew how to draw in the right people uh, into the venues. So how can listeners take an initiative to set themselves apart in business as entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think, you know, at the time I had, when we first started, I kind of had my own promotions company and knew the nightlife world really well. I had been promoting all over town for about three or four years. John at the time was working for DJ AM and kind of had that sort of celebrity niche crowd in Hollywood. And we said, you know, we think there's something missing in the market where like, where are the people we grew up with, our friends and that close network in the kind of high end celebrity art world, um, stylist, that kind of crowd, because they weren't going to their venues. They were going all over the place. And so we sort of said, this is what's missing. Let's focus on that. And that's kind of been our motto the whole time is we, we really care about who's in the room, the crowd. We run the tightest doors in town, I would say. And so to me, that's really what has separated us is focusing on the crowd. I can definitely agree and attest to that after walking into each of the venues. If you could put together a brief overview on the non-negotiable qualities you look for when hiring within the company, what are three non-negotiable qualities in a person you seek out when considering them for a position? Yeah, for me, I, I, I look for the willingness to learn, you know, even... I'm learning every single day. Um, I think I meet a lot of kids or people, whatever it might be, that kind of have something set in their mind. And, and they're, if they can't adapt and learn and adjust, it's going to be a hard um, thing. So I think that's key. I think uh, positivity, optimistic outlook uh, kind of sounds cliche, but if you don't have that day in and day out, pretty hard business to be in. Um and, you know, I think for me, the, the last thing I really look in is it look to or uh, try to try to seek out is people that genuinely enjoy people. Um, I think uh, I think we're in a people business 
and they gotta they gotta really like it. I think it's an important aspect to me. I think well, it depends if it's if, you know if it's someone in the venues. Uh, they have to be extremely outgoing. They have to understand customer service. That they're there to serve other people who are there to have fun. So this isn't their time to get a picture with a celebrity. This isn't their time to, you know, try and sit with them and feel cool. They are there to serve that person, whatever that person wants. And so, you know, that's pretty important. I think, um, you know, the, if, if it's something in the office, we're, that's kind of a different job. You're, you're not always in the venues, it's back of house. So to me, I, we need someone that's extremely hardworking and dedicated. This isn't like any other industry and things pop up all the time where we need people from the office to go and deal with something for an offsite event or all over town. It's kind of like one big group. And I, you know, we, we really are just here to cater the needs of our clients and our customers. In terms of those qualities, have you found it more challenging to find people who possess them? Is it hard to find talented people you can trust, taking into account the clientele that you're serving across the venues? My answer to that uh, go, kind of uh, stems from the previous question, actually, uh, uh, for, for my answer to that, to that part. Uh, while it's always been hard, I agree with Brian on finding the right people. The, the, the ones that we end up do going with and believing in uh, it's almost like we, uh, attract the right type of people to us for how we've kind of led this company, because I'm really proud of the one, the core group that are with us. Um, you know, they, they're the ones that are really helping push and drive and think of new ideas and kind of goes to the, my answer for this current question is, is if you, if we didn't have a little core group of surrounding people that that are you know part of Hwood that we didn't trust. I think it would be really much more challenging. Um, I think you, in times like for example, what we're going through, you know, early on we were like you know everyone was just kind of lost and didn't know what to do. And I think if you don't quickly adapt, you know, we have a head of operations, Jacob, who within a week, you know, was coming up with new plans. We we had really never done big on delivery, for example. And within a week, you know, he and half the core team that we have are coming up with new concepts and basically adapting to the new way of life. And rather than sulk and think about all the negative aspects going on, all of our places are shut. Um, it was, what are we, what's the solution and how are we going to go forward? And I think that it, to me is, is kind of the, the, the end all be all in, in business in general, but especially in ours. I completely agree. And I'm sure that you've both had the conversation around potential competition in such a city and market as LA. So how have you guys sustained a track record of great venues, partnerships and alliances while continuing to expand at the same time? I think the nice thing these days is seems like at least on the nightlife side, it's a little bit more professional and more organized. There's a lot fewer groups doing it. I remember 10, 15 years ago, there was just so many more independent clubs and places and a promoter or someone didn't like what they were doing at one, they would just hop to the next. And now we have a lot less competition. I think a lot of people have tried it and seen that it's actually a really tough industry and not as glamorous as maybe looks. So you're down to fewer competitors. So I think it's easy on that sense. It's a little bit easier to find people that really want to do this as a career if that makes sense. Just to touch on what Brian said, um, I think the key is uh, really having people, everyone have a sense of ownership of Hwood is what I really love and want them to have. Makes me really proud when, you know, the other day I met someone uh, the other day prior to Corona when I, we were allowed to be out and about with people. Um <laughs> The, I met someone and uh, they were talking to me about nice guy. They had no idea that, you know, I, I owned it. And they were like, you know, that's Seth's place, my good friend. It's a great place. And Seth has, you know, been with us forever. And that type of thing made me happy. Like I, I want people to like our, the fact that we have uh, people in our um, company that they have such a sense of pride of Hwood and the venues 
if we lose that, I think we end up losing, you know, and, and I should mention that, you know, we have two other uh, partners, Tony and Adam that really balance out Brian and me as well. They have these other amazing skill sets that, you know, really, um, we all kind of like get to flow together. And I think if we didn't have that, and if we didn't keep growing in that right way, because we're going to have to keep growing and we end up just being stagnant. And so I think even for us and, and uh, Brian and me, I think that's something that we're constantly uh, t- learning and teaching ourselves is each day we have to keep growing and, and empowering the people that are with us. I'm definitely on par with where your head's at, and I'm sure Brian can agree with that as well. I want to zoom in on something you just said, which was how you're at the point now where you're attracting the right people to you just by the company's nature. If anything, it's an indicator for any company or business that they've built something special. So in your opinion, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of turnover in the industry, how do you guys plan to maintain the momentum from a culture and people perspective where do you employ hundreds of people in LA alone? I would say it's twofold. I think number one, we're really great with our people. So we've had people with with us for years now. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's just like, oh, we pay people well. I don't think that's a good answer. I think it's, you know, we give everyone a voice. And so I don't care if they're a marketing person, an accounting person, a promoter. If someone comes in and says, can I meet with you guys? I have this great idea for, um, you know, like we had a DJ, Wade, said, I have a great idea for a karaoke bar. We sat with him. We listened to him. We helped him flush out the concept. And that became Blind Dragon. And so I think it's unique when you can be at a company and you can be heard even if you're not at the top. Um, And we... So in that regards, I think we're, you know, it's, it's different and unique. We're really not like this huge, although we're pretty big these days, um, in terms of number of people, we're not, we, we try and run at mom and pop. We're not this corporate entity where like everyone has to stay in their lane. So I think that is unique. I think the other thing is we do really great events and have great venues. And so people are proud to work for us. Um, it's funny when we do something like our Coachella party that we do every year. We do a big July 4th party at Nobu in Malibu. Every year we have so many like employees and members of staff that want to get on the list and want to come to the parties. Like they really feel like they're part of the family, which is amazing. And they want to be involved and they want to be at everything we do. And so I think uh, having those kind of high end great events has also helped us to get great people because People just sort of naturally want to be a part of those um, and really buy into the culture that we've created. Just to add to that, I think I saw, um, look, we we still, to be honest, you know, as we we still get caught, we still catch ourselves, both Brian and I, you know, uh, accidentally micromanaging our own, our own divisions and having to like pull back or having someone tell us like, Hey, we got this type of thing because it's tough when you're, when you're a, a, when you have a company, it's your, when you found, when you, it's it's your baby basically. So it's, it's a tough situation in the sense that you just, it's not about power. It's more about the fact that you just want it done right. And so it's taken, you know, a lot of years to really be like, you got to trust the team with you. Otherwise, you're not going to grow. This baby of yours is not growing. And so for me, you know, big things that I saw are big strides with the delegation were our pop-ups, um, our, especially our food pop-ups. So we do massive ones with especially like Slab, which is our barbecue place. And, you know, there's a whole team that that just runs with it. They're like, they at this point, they tell Brian and me they have it. You know, they're like, we don't, you know, they update us. We get it all and then you know we there was a recent one i don't i think it was for the la times fe- food festival I mean, it was a big thing thousands of people and slab was you know a star of it and and really our team just ran with it all that perfect food and perfect operations great press and you know that was really all them all, all it was all they're doing that was not brian and me running it and uh that's one of many examples but those are the things that that really make me proud and uh, those are things that kind of have to keep happening in order for us to 
keep growing. John, just a few years ago, you mentioned that you had to shift your leadership philosophy in an effort to not micromanage as much in the business. And I think it can be understood that most entrepreneurs from the start need to have a pulse on everything and everyone to drive the company forward. Mastering the art of delegation, though, can propel business forward more effectively. So could you share an example of when either of you leveraged delegation to yield a positive outcome, maybe even during a venue opening? Um, I think, you know, venue opening were very hands on. So I would say more something like changing a menu. You know, we used to sit in on every tasting and want, we, we had to approve every dish. And as we've opened more and more restaurants, it's harder and harder to do that. And so lately we've really trusted our chefs and our operations people. And so, you know, menu changes at restaurants now, it's great to be able to walk into the nice guy or Delilah and sit down and try a new dish that they've added to the menu and see that it's great and it's up to our standards and customers love it. And, you know, we didn't have to sit there and go through six different tastings to get there. They really sort of get what we're looking for now. So that's always nice to see. And then, you know, creatively, I think our creative team has gotten really great at coming up with branding items, um, logos and things. And it's nice when we kind of say, okay, Delilah, that's the name. And then they sort of run with it. And, you know, we get emails with like, what about this logo? And what about this for the website? And what about this idea for the menu? Um, So it's really great to kind of see the creative side of things, which I am definitely not creative. So it's nice to see other people come up with those things. And it's always impressive to see. So let's shift gears a little bit. Tell us an untold story of a situation or adventure you two have had over the years. I know you guys have been tied up and put yourselves in some interesting situations. Adventure. Business related or just in general? Whatever you think is the most juicy. <laughs> I mean, look, I'll, I'll tell just so for anyone, anyone that's listening, trying to be an entrepreneur, I will say that we went through, um, just like anyone, a lot of years of really hard times where you had to, we had to scrap and scrape and do whatever we could to get, get attention. And so, you know, we were early on when we were trying to raise, um, we were trying to raise money. Uh, we would just meet, especially me, but we would meet with everyone. I mean, if, if you had a cousin that would meet with me, I was meeting. If you had anyone, just meet with anyone that would be interested in investing in our concept. And one, <laughs> One of the uh, one of the one of the uh, guys that we were trying to attract wanted to take a trip to Bolivia. Is it Bolivia, Brian? Oh my God! Yes. I I basically nominated Brian to go on that trip with him. I didn't. I refused to. And uh, Brian and him had a very interesting uh, trip there, where he basically Brian called me and was like, "This is this guy is just." running around doing nothing and so i think i've tried to block this from my memory thanks for bringing it up point point of the story is is that uh we had a lot of a lot of guys like that and and they lead to a lot of uh roadblocks and a lot of dead ends but you have to kind of keep going and search through a thousand of them to get one to believe in you yeah i think actually similar story to the to my bolivia adventure with llamas (laughs) Um, when we were trying to, when we were almost done with the deal with Hakkasan, it happened to be right before the Cannes Film Fest. And we generally do an event out there at Cannes and we weren't going to do it that year. And then the person whose money basically was behind Hakkasan, uh, wanted to do an event out there in Cannes, uh, he was out there. He was on his boat. He wanted to celebrate the deal. And so we basically threw this makeshift party together. We told them, look, if you want to fly us out there and bring our team, we'll try and put something together. So on about a week's notice, we like book trips to, to Cannes. Um, there were barely any flights left. So you had we had like layover after layover. Um, but we were like, look, if we don't get this done, we're not going to get the deal done. So... I think it was probably four or five of us and John and I, neither one of us had been married yet. We were with our current wives. Um, but they were just our girlfriends and we're like, Oh, we're going to can. We brought them along. So it was probably seven of us. And of course we land in London and there's 
a strike going on with the French airlines. So you couldn't fly into France unless you were on like Air France. There were no flights. So everything's canceled. So we're in London. The party's the next night. We're reaching out to Hakkasan saying, we don't know how to get into France. We may have to get on a train. This is a disaster. And basically the CEO was like, well, whatever you need to do, rent a fucking car, but you need to get here right now or this guy's going to be upset. So we ended up uh, taking a train to Paris because once you were in France, you could get down to Cannes. So all of us, we had to like get on a bus to go from one airport to the other, to the train station. Um, we were panicking. We're calling travel agents trying to get us on a flight out of uh, different airports. We, we took the train to Paris. We ended up having to do a layover from like Paris to God knows Amsterdam or something. We finally make it into Cannes. Uh, it took about, it, we honestly were flying and traveling for about 36 hours, something like that. It was crazy. We finally get there. We end up doing the party and it worked and the deal ended up closing and we made it work. But that was one of the most stressful couple days of my life getting through and making sure that that party actually happened. Incredible. You really hear these types of things happen only ever so often. Yeah, exactly. On the contrary, could you share a story at the same level that you guys experienced in business? Something that people just couldn't believe such a thing really happened. One story that, you know, there's many uh, on, but we have interesting <laughs> stories with bottle buyers. We had a guy that um, came in and said, hey, I'm going to spend uh, half a million dollars at your place buying bottles. And um, that's like a big thing to do. And it's obviously a lot of money. So we're like, great. So they come, they come in and we're catering to the guy left and right. And he, he says, I want to send a present right now. It's midnight, by the way. I want to send a present to the table over there. And he wanted a live chicken dressed in a tuxedo with a top hat. I'm dead serious. And, uh, you know, I spent the next 40 minutes trying to wake up farms and uh, <laughs> people that I knew to get the, uh, get the chicken. Then I was worried about health laws if I actually could get the chicken. Uh, and and uh, I, ended up, I ended up getting a fake one and dressing, dressing up that chicken and it delivered it. And um, and in in that night, and it turned out to be that guy was Jolo, who ended up being a uh, extreme uh, extreme criminal fraud fraudulent guy that the billion dollar whale book is on. So we have a lot of stories like that that go on throughout the years, and and you just uh, you just kind of have to roll with it. If we were to shift gears back and get vulnerable for a minute. Could you give us an example from your lives of a particular mistake and what you may have learned from it, reflecting on it, you know, after the fact, specifically in your career as well in business? Part of a mistake was not listening to the city and to the police and thinking that we were protected. And, you know, our, our, our first venue, H, would, we did a great job as two 25-year-olds filling the place. We were slammed busy and we used to get neighbor complaints. And at first we would laugh it off and say, you live across the street from a nightclub. What do you expect? And we would talk to our landlord and, you know, we were on the side of the Hollywood Highlands Center. And the landlord was like, don't worry about it. We're an entertainment zone. Like they're just being difficult. So we didn't listen. And then they would, it seemed like almost every night we would get these neighbors calling our phone and then the cops would show up and the cops would say at first, well, there's a, look, we had to come check it out. There's not much we could do. And then it started to get more serious. And the cops said, guys, we're tired of coming. Like, you can't have this many people here. Turn the music down. And we said, well, we get to go till two. And we sort of didn't listen. Um, then we started to get kind of moved up the chain at the LAPD. It started to get kind of higher level people calling and coming and Again, we figured we had a lease. The landlord would protect us. We were we were not doing anything illegal. We were just playing music loudly, which we thought we, we were told by the landlord we were allowed to do. Um, flash forward six months or so, uh, we were declared a public nuisance by the city. We were shut down. We were not allowed to do valet past, I think it was like 11 p.m. No loud music past 10 p.m. So... Even though we thought we were okay because we weren't doing anything 
technically wrong. Um, and we were in line with our CUP. So we kept saying, well, look, it says right here we can do it. They actually ended up changing the CUP, which is the conditional usage permit and basically put us out of business. We weren't allowed to operate. And so I think looking back now, when we look at different places, we look around and say, oh no, there's, there's a neighbor right behind or this is next door. And so we're, we're certainly more careful about which locations we pick because uh, that can come back to hurt you. So I'm sure you've both been told no many times. So is there a story in particular of a time that a no shifted to a yes in your careers as entrepreneurs, do you have a motto that sort of reflects that? So my whole motto for for us and for myself is that there's there's never a no. You know, when there is a no, I try to find the heart of what the no is, or you know, get get into the actual uh, psychology of the person. Um, and I think early on, or not early on, midway, the the with this Hawkesan deal, that was the biggest no that shifted to a yes. Um, uh, we when we wanted to buy out of our Hawkesan deal, the first answers were no. Um, figured we wanted to buy them out and grow and have a new investors, and it took about six months uh, of us flying, meeting with the individuals involved. Really, it was a really person to person relationship. Um, situation where where you had to develop the relationship in order to actually get the answer to change to yes, um, because they just they did not want to let go of uh, of their ownership with us, and we needed to in order to get in new investors for growth because we needed to open new places. And I think if we hadn't done that and we hadn't spent the time, we would be stuck probably to this day. And and, and it was a really key shift, and that was only a couple of years ago, um, to get them to, to change their mind. What you said there is truly important. One, being patience. Second, being persistence. And especially analyzing the psychology of people in the business world. In business and in hospitality, what's your insight, per se, in examining and analyzing voids in a marketplace and filling them in a tasteful way? How do you guys determine what's worth going after? You know, for example, the decision to take Delilah to Las Vegas. I think that's one of our strengths between John and myself and the, you know, close people in the company. We all travel so much. We go to so many restaurants and so many clubs and hotels. We've we're I think that has been really beneficial in seeing what works in different parts of the world, different parts of the country and seeing and we really know LA well also, which I think is a uh, really helpful. We've none of neither John or myself have lived in any other city. So but 40 years of being here, we've seen what's worked and what hasn't worked. Um, and I think we talk all the time about, you know, I wish LA had this, or I wish LA had that. And that that's really what made us do the nice guy. We had always had nightclubs and bars and we said, you know, what's missing here is a place where at this point you can go out. It doesn't have to be a club. It doesn't have to be loud music, but where it's actually a restaurant with a tight door with great food, but you, it's also a lounge and people can, they can eat at other places and they can just come and reserve a table for drinks at 11 o'clock. And that just never existed in LA forever. Um, and that was really what made us build the nice guy. And people doubted us and said, Oh, you, that, that doesn't work. Um, you have to just be a restaurant. You can't be everything. And you guys are just nightclub guys. And I think we really proved everybody wrong with the nice guy. And, from there, it was the same thing with Delilah. We looked at the nice guy and we had huge success. We made all of our money back on the investment for the nice guy in about nine months, which is unheard of in a restaurant. Um, and I think people, they wanted to do bottle service. People were trying to reserve tables for minimums. And we never, ever allowed any of that, which is really which set up, what set us apart. And that's what made people feel comfortable being in there. And then for Delilah, we said, we need something that's a little bit closer to a club where we can do bottle minimums. Um, you can let in groups that are willing to pay the money. We can let people stand on booths if they want to party a little bit. We're at Nice Guy. We never allowed that. Never allowed bottles on the table at the Nice Guy. And so we really kind of analyzed what was missing. And that was what kind of was the impetus for Delilah. And same thing for Vegas. It's like when 
we said, where's the place we should go next? We talked New York, we talked Miami, we talked all these other cities, and then we kind of decided Vegas should be next, although it's a little bit weird to open your second restaurant in Vegas versus a different city like that. It seemed like that is missing in Vegas as well, that there's a million great nightclubs, there's a million great restaurants, but there isn't that middle ground. And I know that when we go to Vegas with our wives or whatever, like we're not going to go to a nightclub, but there really isn't an option. And so I think Delilah will be that perfect fit for Vegas. I think the key is living and breathing the industry and really observing and watching what people are gravitating to or not. And it's hard. It's, it's easier said than done. You have to really be tr- honest with yourself about what people are, are liking, not liking, and then seeing what, what void there is and what niche you can fill, you know? And, and it's, it's not a, it's not an easy thing to conquer, but those examples are great, you know? And I, I think that, uh, you know, what Brian uh, didn't mention about Delilah, for example, it kind of goes back to the question before was when we were building it, you know, no one wanted to back it. They didn't believe that you could do the combo of nightlife and dining. And we had, we had really lived and breathed, you know, the city for X amount of years and seen that it's needed and it, and it could work if it's executed right, just like anything. And we stuck to our conviction, we stuck to our guns and found people to back it uh with us after a you know a good amount of time and stayed true to the concept and uh really really went with it in LA and now it's as you see it's it's that opening in Vegas and we plan for it in other places but it could have very easily never existed if we hadn't watched what was going on and filled a void because that's really how it, it started If we were to touch upon what inspires you two, are there any inspirations that you guys draw from your lives individually or places that you've traveled to? Have there been any elements that have made their way into the fabric of your venues? Yeah, I think without specifically naming them, I think when we did, you know, the nice guy was sort of an ode to the mafia. And then when it came time for Delilah, we said we need a name that's a bit more feminine. And we looked around the world and there were some great places that sort of had like a woman's name. And so we were kind of dead set on that. We threw around a million different names and Delilah really sort of fit, but seeing what was going on in London and other cities with names, I think that definitely came into play. Um, I think dishes as well, when we're eating at restaurants at different places, we're constantly looking at things saying like, oh, something like this would be great at this restaurant or that restaurant. So uh, we're constantly learning and trying new things. I think it's key to what we do. No question. At the end of the day, you two are at the center of the ecosystem within the hospitality and restaurant business. So, you know, it's a high pressure industry. If we were to, you know, zoom in on the constant hustle and need to be on point, how do you two stay grounded in in such an industry? I think one, it's our natural uh, demeanor. So that's that helps when it starts to but but with that said, I think our I think our early failures, deep failures, by the way, <laughs> uh, really really helped ground how we are business wise. And, and I don't think either of us like you know as optimistic as I am on on everything. I I, I never get like I never get anything that's overexcited or think that we're better than any anyone or anything because we really have had you know, things taken from us and have failed and have, we've, we've experienced it all. And so, you know, and if it weren't for our friends and family and each other, I think we would have not made it through. And so that that's grounding. We both have, you know, families and best friends that are not in the industry and, and they ground us tremendously in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and I think if we didn't have that, that would be an issue as well. Um, so I think those are really the guiding, um, forces for me uh, on a like personal level. I try to every, every Sunday is just with my wife and, uh, now son spend time at the beach and have really try to think about nothing else other than just normal life. And then I also spend, uh, try to spend once a week with all my high school, you know, my friends from high school, best friends from high school are still my best friends. And 
try to spend once a week with them or once at this point, you know, um, once a month, uh, and just not nothing about business, just actual normal life. And it really helps get your mind off everything. And I think that's kind of like, I think it's something that is important to any entrepreneur is to step outside of, of what you're doing mentally for a moment, uh, on a regular basis is I think key. I definitely agree with you, John. And I think, you know, taking a step mentally outside of the workflow can really work wonders. Once you guys dive back into the office, though, could you draw us into some of your leadership philosophies that you guys employ across Hwood holistically? I think we lead by example. I think we have different methods, but I think, um, you know, we have, uh, we have a lot of like young, impressionable people as we get older that kind of look up to us and see how we do things. So I think it's very important that we are involved day to day and we're not just like some CEO or, you know, in an office that the company doesn't get to talk to. I think we, I, we really talk to everyone. We make sure both of us that when we walk in the venue, if we're walking through the back, we say hi to every single person in the kitchen, kitchen from the head chef to the dishwasher, to the expediter, like everyone knows us. Um, I think the staff sees us in the venues almost on a nightly basis. Well, definitely on a nightly basis for John. Um, you know, we're there We're we're not just like some face, like they, they see us there. They see us marketing. They see us bringing people in. Um, and it makes them want to do the same. And I think that's so important. I, when, when I'm at the nightclubs, I, I walk through, I, I pick up glasses and bring it to the kitchen. Like I'm not there to party. Um, we're there to work. And so before a big table's coming, we make sure we're standing there. We make sure it's clear. We make sure we greet the customer. Um, I think being hands-on has really, really separated us from our competition. Yeah, I'd say probably two things. I'd say, I'd say that is a big thing. Lead by example. I'd say um, uh, for me, I, I always felt that there's going to be smarter people out there, or better looking, or whatever it might be, but they're never going to be able to outwork me and us. And so, really try to have that be a thing where you know we're in a business that you need to work hard. It's not that I expect everyone like that, but I think it's good for them to see that it takes hard work. And then the other big philosophy for me is is at all times being above board. There's a lot of shortcuts that, that you can take, and it isn't like the movies where it's so villainous and so easy to see that you know, you're know you a criminal if you make this move or not. There's a million little shortcuts that people can and will take uh, in, in business, and, and we we really do not. We make a real effort to be the exact opposite. And, you know, it's important for me to have the people see, hear, understand, and believe in that, that work for and with us. I think that is what will end up having us last. That's all great to hear. You know, what I'd love to know is that through bringing Hwood to the level that you two have, where does the vision for the company stand from your eyes in the next five to 10 years? Where would you like to see it? I think the goal for us moving forward is kind of less is more mentality. Um, meaning we really just want to focus on a couple brands and expand those. We really feel like the nice guy and Delilah um, are so different from anything else and unique and can really work in any city. And so the goal for the next, I'd say five, 10 years is to expand those brands. There was a period here where we had so many great opportunities kind of fall in our lap in LA. And so we just kind of kept taking and taking and taking. And I think we've seen that we we're sort of cannibalizing ourselves. And if a customer or a friend texts us saying, Hey, where should I eat tonight? You know, you can't send them to every single place. So we're hurting ourselves that our goal is really to do nice guys in Delilah's New York, Miami, London, um, Asia, Europe, like all over the place. I think that's the, the, the main goal. And then I think we also want to get into hotels. It's kind of the next logical step. We've done nightclubs, we've done bars, we've done restaurants. We would love to do a hotel that sort of fits with our service and our look of our venues and those kinds of things. I I echo that. Yeah, that's, that's our goal. Um, You know, my goal is for H Wood group to be synonymous with quality hospitality. So if you think of every industry, you think of uh, the top, automatically and or, or whatever whichever industry you can think of and 
to yeah. automatically think of what the best is at. So that we're striving towards that. And that's going to be, that's going to come from us with leadership and the people with us and uh, the venues that we uh, build and own and operate. Awesome. Love to hear that and looking forward to seeing what the future holds for you both and the company. Although many people listening may be familiar with Hwood and its venues, where can everyone find and connect with you? Yeah, our website is uh, hwoodgroup.com. That's H-W-O-O-D-G-R-O-U-P. And then I guess we're both on Instagram. I'm at Brian Toll. I'm at John Terzian. Perfect. Thank you, Brian and John, for joining us. It was a pleasure having you guys on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Thank you for tuning in to Access TV's Unlock the Minds podcast. Before you go, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you may be listening on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. And engage with us on Instagram at access.tv. 